Responders to disasters or emergencies in your neighborhoods are not only the professionals, the fire service, the police, the ambulances. Ordinary folks are being trained to become members of the community emergency response teams. I'll be talking to a member of one team in this program. Not everyone has the inspiration to write a book. One of my guests will tell you about her book, what inspired her to write it, and what her readers are telling her. You'll also meet a Brooklyn young academic achiever who, even though optic nerve damage has forced him to live every day with night blindness and severe nearsightedness, he's an A student who you'll want to hear from. People who live in communities are being trained to become members of the community emergency response teams. Joining me to tell us what exactly they do is Glenn Wolin, Sir Director for Community Board 14, and I hope that's correct. Well, I'm generally called Team Chief or President. I prefer that. Yeah. Okay. Team Chief is good. All right. What exactly do you do? Well, our job is to prepare ourselves and our community in case of a disaster. So we train in things like uh, light search and rescue uh, or radio exercises, uh, whatever we can do to help our neighbors in a disaster. Now, I'd like to clarify that a disaster, according to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is when there are more victims than there are responders. So as long as there are enough first responders, we might help out around the edges, but it's only in a major disaster that we would come together as teams to go out into our neighborhood and try to help our neighbors. How many teams are there? You said you're from Community Board 14, but are there other community boards involved in this? New York City Emergency Management has been trying to develop a team in every community district in the city, of which there are 59. At this moment, I believe there are 51 active teams around the city at varying levels of readiness. Varying levels of readiness. What is readiness? Uh, being in a position to uh, activate in a, in a worst case scenario and go out and help your neighbors. Uh, having radio equipment so we can send teams out and communicate with them, for example. Having some stores of food and water, medical supplies, and things of that sort. Uh, and running radio exercises so people who are not used to using a handheld radio have some idea of how to use one. Do you work um, outside of the emergencies? Do you have training sessions with the disaster teams, the teams that have to be on the spot in case there is a disaster, the police, the ambulances, the fire service? Very rarely. Uh, on those occasions when there are major exercises in the city, uh, if we're invited at all, it's usually to be victims so we can witness how the first responders handle the situation. So that's the training part? On occasion, yes. Yes. Um, how are neighborhood people responding to your invitations to be a part of this exercise? Well, the way we interact with the, the neighborhood is mostly through things like tabling events uh, at street fairs, or sometimes we're invited to give presentations, in which case we can talk to people about CERT and the Ready New York uh, program. Um, and Ready New York is about personal disaster preparedness. And how can the community join CERT? Uh, the best way to do that at this time is online. There is a, a website, uh, nicem.samaritan.com. If you go onto that website, you can find out more information about CERT and how to sign up for the next round of training. Okay, repeat that website again. Nicem, N Y C E M, dot Samaritan, S A M A R I T A N, dot com. Now, <clears throat> your profile said that there are non emergency projects in neighborhoods that you respond to. What would be these non-emergency projects? Well, um, mostly it's things like uh, helping out with uh, the Five Borough Bike Tour or MS Walks or um, there's now a Brooklyn Half Marathon, things of that sort, where we help uh, keep things running smoothly. How long have you been doing this? Since 2004. So just over 13 years. I was one of the first people trained by uh, FEMA trainers 
before uh, New York City Emergency Management started training people. Now, do you work with other community boards? Do you work with other community Me boards? Me personally, yes. yes. I, I have offered, since, since we are a little further along in the development of a team, I've offered assistance to any team that's interested. Uh, I have worked closely with a gentleman in Community Board 17, Victor Jordan, who is just now establishing a team in that community district. Mm. What, what district is that? Community District 17. Okay. That's pretty close to Community Boards 14. We share a border. Now, do you work with other community boards in other boroughs? Not directly. Uh, indirectly through the team chiefs meeting where we're all invited to get together. Uh, we do meet lots of people from around the city. There's also borough team chiefs where, uh, meetings where we get together with various Brooklyn team chiefs. I want to thank you for being on Brooklyn 45. This is very interesting information. Am I able to be part of CERT? We would love to have you take the training and join CERT. How do you reach out to, to people other than you know, your, your tables that you have at various community events? Any, any way that we can, such as being invited on this TV show. Okay. Well, we're happy to have you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, we hope that we don't have a reason for CERT to come <laughs> into our neighborhoods, but we never know, you know when, when the need will arise. Well, we think of it like insurance that we hope we never need, but yes. if you do, it's good to have it there. Thank you very much for being on Brooklyn 45. And thank you so much, sir. And now to our young academic achiever, here is Pat Jacobs. Thank you, Sam. With me is Ryan Maxwell, a grade 8 student at Lenox Academy, a school for the talented and gifted. Welcome, Ryan. It's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure you, to be here. You are, to, you are at Lenox, and at Lenox, you, students are allowed to take three regions and Spanish proficient. Spanish proficiency in the grade eight. You are actually doing two regions and Spanish. How do you manage this workload? Well, I really try to strive and um, manage my time and, you know, prioritize, you know, what I, I think my work is very important to me. So I prioritize my homework. Um, I try to study for at least like, 30 minutes to an hour a day, and um, I just try to be persistent in my work. So you have some challenges. Right? Can you tell us about that? Well, since I was born, I have had nearsightedness, which means that um, I cannot see objects that are far away clearly without my glasses. And with my glasses, it's very difficult for me to read small print um, writing. So I have many different um, equipment to help me deal with that challenge. And, and the interesting thing, you're in a school that really does not um, provide resources for you with this setback or this drawback. How do you manage in such an environment? Well, I would say... I've never been in a, in a special ed class before, but I'm able to advocate for myself um, and I try to speak with teachers and other forms of authority and ask them, you know, about things that I need and also to explain to them my situation so that they can understand, you know, what my needs are. You know, I think you're such an outstanding student because you have this, this, um, disability, well, you know, you have the challenges of, of not being able to see very well. And yet you are scoring 90 and above. What do you think contributes to this achievement? I would say, um, well, many different factors contribute to it. For one, I, I grew up in an area where my parents, you know, teachers, family, they all encouraged me to work hard despite of my issues and and as a you know for myself I really think of it as representing for other students with disabilities to show you know to show everyone that I am disabled but I have the ability but I know that because you sing you dance you're in theater 
You play the piano. What motivates you really? Um, I would say my motivation in the arts is that I have a depletion in one sense, sense, but the arts really helps me to bring out my other senses and see the world, see my work, see life in a new, in a new light since I can get in tune with hearing and smell and touch and since my eyesight isn't as great. You're in a theater workshop? Yes. And is that a yearly workshop? Um, yes. And um, I also think you are involved in church as well. Mm -hmm. So I would regard you as an all-rounder. What advice would you give to students who have particular challenges? To students with challenges, I would say you're representing, you know, a generation of students who are growing up in a world who they, they can show people that they have the ability to do just as great as people who don't have a disability. Because when you think about it, in, in older days, students with disabilities didn't have that many opportunities and things. So this is our chance to rise up and show the world what we can do. So they have to be, they have to have that mindset. Exactly. How important is, is a mind in, 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 in striving for, for, for your goals? Well, the mind is a very important thing because you have to have the ability to learn from your mistakes and grow from them and, and you know, really just be diligent in your mistakes and learning from them. That sounds like you're talking about the growth mindset. Yes. Um, you try to apply that, that principle? Exactly. In, in terms of learning from your mistakes and never feeling that you cannot achieve? Do you use the word can't? If, if I did, then I... You hardly use exactly. it. Exactly. Because you, you, you don't think it's something, you, the challenges are things that you can't surpass. Mm -hmm. What's next for Ryan? Well, I would like to attend college for a teacher, for teaching. Why? Well, I really, I really want to empower children, not only with disabilities, but, you know, normal ed children to, you know, grow and be empowered and do the best of what they can do. What do you want to teach? Um, English or music. Why? Because language is, and music are both important tools to guide you know, everything. They're, they're such important ways to get messages across. OK. Well, it seems as if you are really on the right track. And I wish for you every success, and I'm pretty sure we are going to hear more about Thank Ryan you. Maxwell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Throwing back to you, Sam. Thank you, Pat. The Esperance Empire presents Poison. Here's a book that was recently published by one of our reporters, Kellan Esperance, uh, who is on the other side of the microphone tonight. Right. Welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me. Whatever inspired you to write this book? What inspired me to write the book was um, many women suffer silently in uh, relationships that are abusive. And um, I needed women to see themselves and to understand that they're not alone and that they can speak up and they can seek help even at their lowest and their weakest point. You do a lot of research for your reports here on Brooklyn 45, but what about the research that you've done for this book? Because are you doing this from experience or from the needs that you observe and you've researched? The, um, this is coming from experience of having friends and family members who are in that situation currently and who have survived. Have you been in touch with your friends and family members since I'm assuming they've read this book? Well, the book was released in January. No one has reached out to me yet, the ones that are going through it currently. But the ones who have, they say that it's very realistic. In what way? As in um, the way the main character, Naomi, behaves as far as not being able to leave her abuser. The love that she believes keeps them together and not realizing that pain is not love. Pain 
is not love. It's not love. Love is kind. Love is patient, right? Yes. <laughs> love doesn't hurt. Okay. Why did you name this book Poison? I just wanted people to know that not only women are poison, but men are poison too. Hmm. Expand, men... expand on that, please. Uh, and do we see that in this book? Yes, you do. A man can enter your life and he can take away your beauty, your career. He can destroy you. And not just the women. What do you expect people to take away from this book? I can expect people to um, learn the signs of uh, an aggressive man or learn the signs of a dysfunctional relationship. I'm expecting to bring awareness to dysfunctional relationships and um, people to get a clear understanding instead of judging the women who are currently in them. What do we see in this book that speaks to what you've just been talking about? Give us some, some, some of the readings from this book that, that you are very, very, very taken up with and really want people to, to dig into, deeply into. Um, the very beginning, where I start from 1995, where the young girl uh, witnesses her mother being abused by her father. And I realize most women who are abused they see it in their home. They've seen their mother go through it. And unfortunately, it happens to them. So that's uh, very prominent. At the beginning of the program, we talked about you're doing research for this book. Right. Sometimes people write books based on their own personal experience. Um, is any personal experience um, that you have lived through a part of this book? No. It's all pure imagination and uh, recalling phone calls of my friends calling me about what he did this time and she's tired and she's back again with him. So that's what it is. Where are you promoting this book? This book is on Amazon. All digital copies are on Amazon. Um, I do distribute paperbacks on my website, Kellen Esperance at bigcartel.com. You said that very quickly. <laughs> Kellan, go to that. Kellan again. Esperance. That's K E L L A N. Last name is E S P E R A N C E. At Big Cartel. I have to ask you, what is the future going to be for you? Because I see here the Esperance Empire yes. presents. <laughs> now, where are you going with your life? Well, I self publish all my books and I plan to become a publishing house as well as a film producer. So someday I would like to turn my books into films. What other books have you published? I've published Let Love, Let Love 2, Almond Joy, Single After 30, and Poison. Everyone, <laughs> you've really got to read the book Poison, a novel by Kellan Esperance. You see her every now and again on Brooklyn 45, but now she is talking about her own book and her own future. I want to wish you success. Thank you. And I know you'll do very well. Thank you. My special guest is Diedrich McCalmont, a senior at Brooklyn Technical High School. Welcome, Diedrich. Thank you. Now, we know that you are involved with music. Mm -hmm. We know that you love music. And we have invited you to share your knowledge and your, mm -hmm. your perspective about music. But could you start off by telling us some of the things that you did this past year? So first and foremost, what's really the cultivating moment of my year is the Spring Musical. This past year, we've just done Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, in which I played the role of John Michelle, a revolutionary during the era. Um, but besides from that, I've also been a part of the school's chamber choir, and I've also played cello in their orchestra. And... Um there's another group, I think, that you have been involved with. Yes. I've been involved with the Muslim Interscholastic Tournament, which is basically a forum for, for different groups of Muslim teenagers, and they, partic they partake in different competitions. For example, I'm part of the Nasheed group, so we put together an a cappella piece that we sing at the competition. And this is, is it just local, or, or d does it go to the state level? It goes to... It goes to the state level, but it also goes to the national level. So have you reached the national level? I have reached the national level. So here, here is what I find interesting, because you said it's, a, it's, it, it, it's it, the group consists of Mus students who are Muslims. Yes. Are you a Muslim? No, I'm not. So the, 
this shows to me that you are able to embrace people mm -hmm. of different faiths yes. and different culture. How important do you think that is for, for, for teenagers to, to be able to do? I think that's just incredibly important, especially going to a school like Brooklyn Tech where the population isn't just, um, for example, white. There are, there's a very large Muslim, very large Asian population. And I think it's really a special skill to, to be able to embrace all kinds of people, especially if you're going to go into business like music. I think you need to be able to interact with all different kinds of people, especially in a society today where there are still all these tensions between people. Every day you can just look on the news and you see all the bad things that happen in the world. Maybe if people could just embrace each other a little bit more, things like that would happen less. And you think music helps to do that? Oh, definitely. I think music really invigorates each soul on the earth. I think it's emotion, and I think it drives people to do things. I think it encourages them, and it just makes their spirits soar. And I think that just being in mist, I can see that. Music really brings you together. You're no longer thinking, oh, I'm white, uh, he's black, you know, you're no longer thinking you're so different. You're just coming together for a common goal. And you can see the commonality. Yes. Um, apart from MIST, you have, you have been involved in some other groups. Yes. Tell us about that. So I've also been involved in the Tri-M Music Honor Society at my school. Um, it's basically kind of like um, the National Honor Society, but for music students. And within that, within the, our chapter at school, we help to empower leaders of music education and we help to support all of the music events that happen at our school. I think, I think, I, I did some research and, mm -hmm. and that group is a part of the National Association, an affiliate of the National Association of Music Education. Yes. Um, no, one of the things they encourage young people to do is to become music advocates. Yes. In a minute. Can you advocate for music? I think music is just the most human thing on the earth. I mean, going back to the times in slavery, they used those songs to keep them going when they knew their masters. The Negro spirituals it you're Yes, the about? Negro spirituals, anything from Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. They used those to keep them alive. It was more powerful than anything they could have thought of. And I think music, it just it brings people together, together and it brings them alive. Now, you also played in um, a festival at Carnegie Hall. I did, twice. Twice? Twice. Um, what group was that? So it's like, the, it's like the Carnegie Hall Festival Choir. So basically choirs from different schools around the country, they all join at Carnegie Hall so that they can sing um, a number of pieces. And, and there was another, you won some, some awards, gold or something? Gold and silver awards at the New York State School Music Association. But you seem to just be going from competition to competition. <laughs> Do you like competition? Um, I don't. It makes my heart raise. But I feel it's a challenge. And I'm up to any challenge because I think you really need to be headstrong in this world if you're going to get somewhere. So challenges are welcome. Mistakes are wonderful. Oh, that sounds like something that I learned somewhere about the growth mindset. <laughs> the growth you, mindset. You, you are going to, um, you mentioned it, it will take you somewhere. Where do you want to go? I want to be on Broadway. And I, not just that, I want to participate in movies and TVs. I just really want to perform and just put my stuff out there. You're doing a little bit of that now, I hear. Yes. Um, I have a summer internship, I guess you would call it with a production company, and we're actually putting on a brand new musical at the Midtown International Theater Festival. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 17. How do you manage to do so many things? It's so tiring during the year, but I think if you can push past through the tired and you can really think, wow, look at what I'm a part of, then you can really just, you can go past it, and then the end result will be wonderful. And I think that's all part of the growth mindset. Well, I, I am pretty sure one of these days I'll have to probably come and pay some big money to see you on Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to wrap this now, but, but, but we want to also recognize the fact that you are getting, what, what grade point average? 3.7. Diedrich, it is a pleasure having you in studio, and we wish you all the best, and we will read about you and hear about you soon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.
Back to you, Sam. You can watch this Brooklyn 45 program on our Brooklyn 45 TV YouTube channel. And we'd love you to go to our Facebook page and post your comments. And please read this book and post your comments as well. Again, if you know a middle school or high school student who has an average of 90 or above, and you'd love to have him or her featured on Brooklyn 45, go to our Facebook page and message us or email us at info.brooklyn45.com. That's info at brooklyn45.com. On behalf of our entire Brooklyn 45 production team, thank you for watching Brooklyn 45.